I'd like to thank the Baylor Institute for Studies in Religion and David Babington for the invitation to speak at this online conference. Latin America and Transnational Charismatic Renewal. In these last days, the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing in Argentina and in all of Latin America and in many parts of the world. The Holy Spirit is starting to regroup us into only two groups, those who love one another and those who do not love one another. Of the Latin American contributions to the 1974 Lausanne Congress, that of Juan Carlos Ortiz is often overlooked. While Samuel Escobar and René Padilla challenged Western Christians to consider the social dimensions of the gospel, Ortiz brought a distinctively charismatic challenge, born out of his ministry in Buenos Aires, the renewal of the churches, Protestant mainline, Catholic and Pentecostal, in the unifying power of the Holy Spirit. Switzerland was only one stop in a busy global schedule for Ortiz, with the United States, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom each on his itinerary in the mid-1970s. Most of the gatherings at which he spoke were associated with the charismatic renewal, which I define here as a translocal, media-driven, imagined community involving mainline, independent and Pentecostal groups. While there is some existing scholarship on the considerable impact of the English-speaking world uh, charismatic renewal on the Latin American sphere, much less has been said about the reverse and the mobilities and reflexes which produced multi-directional flows of influence. I say this as someone who is not a Latin Americanist and will shortly publish a history of charismatic renewal in the English-speaking world between 1950 and 1980. In writing this study, though, I've become increasingly convinced of the necessity of placing this distinctive networked subculture of charismatic renewal within a wider global context of flows of pieties, including Pentecostal, deeper or victorious life, Catholic devotionalisms and various others. As the historians Mark Hutchinson and Paul Freston asserted long before I came to my research, United States-centric narratives of charismatic renewal need to be problematised. Relevant here is that some accounts of charismatic renewal, recited by participants and sometimes reiterated in scholarship, tend to emphasise with more or less nuance two trajectories. One Protestant, beginning with Episcopalians and Dennis Bennett in Los Angeles in 1960, and one Catholic, beginning with students and faculty of Duquesne University in 1967. From these starting points, the story inevitably tends to become one of expansion and export. However, not only can such historical narratives tend to minimise the role of, say, old Commonwealth networks, they can also miss the multidirectional mobilities and cross-cultural exchanges between the Global North and Global South, which shaped the imaginary of charismatic renewal. To il illustrate this point, I'm going to discuss four examples of Christian renewal in the Latin American sphere, which, which were to profoundly impact the English-speaking world. So firstly, Brazilian Baptists and the deeper life pursuit of evangelical re-enchantment. Amber Thomas at Wheaton has argued in a study of Christian Life magazine that deeper or victorious life piety was one stream, one important stream, of what converged as charismatic renewal. Indeed, in reading the volumes of Robert Walker's Chicago-based magazine for the 1950s, two interconnected themes seem overwhelmingly evident. First, a heightened expectation of worldwide re revival, not only through the ministry of Billy Graham, but also through intelligence of global awakenings, for example, Congo, Rwanda and Japan. Second, a clear sense of dissatisfaction with a putatively cerebral and biblicist spirituality, and a searching for what I have called elsewhere a re-enchanted evangelicalism. This was evident, for example, in articles by deeper life stalwarts such as A.W. Tozer on the second stage crisis experience. It was also apparent in reports of signs and wonders and spiritual warfare from the mission field. For example, a 1958 story um, from Ecuador led one writer to ask, quote, in this enlightened scientific age, 
is it possible to believe in demons? Asking readers then even more directly, quote, are demons present on Main Street and Times Square, USA? Eight years earlier in Christian Life magazine, a report had asserted that, quote, evidence that the Spirit of God works in revival power had come from, quote, Catholic-dominated South America. The article cited the, um, a child evangelism fellowship conference at the Pedro Bible Institute near Rio de Janeiro, where representatives of eight denominations, uh, pastors, students and missionaries, had wept and confessed sins for four hours. Soon after, the spiritual revival movement in Brazil caught the imagination of evangelicals in North America and uh, in other parts of the English-speaking world. With, for example, Northern Ireland's J. Edwin Orr, who visited Brazil in 1952, reporting in Christian Life on the power of united prayer and what he saw as a, a balance achieved between direction and spontaneity. And I quote, when spirit-filled men and women united in spirit-directed prayers for revival, their persevering, persistent prayers will result in a mighty outpouring of God's spirit such as the world has yet to see. In 1961, a series of articles appeared on a movement of spirit baptism amongst Baptists, along with some Methodists and Presbyterians. This had two separate sources, it appears. One, the Reverend Jose Ego de Nascimento, the minister of Sixth Baptist Church in Belo Horizonte, who appears to have come into the experience in 1954 as a result of his own spiritual searching, following a period of dissatisfaction with his ministry. The second, a Southern Baptist ministry named Rosalie Appleby. In 1956, after the two spoke at a Baptist youth convention, interest in the experience of spirit baptism began to move through Baptist networks quickly. Robert Walker's description of this movement in the, 19, in the May 1961 issue of Christian Life quoted the Baptist Antonio Martins Villas Boas, a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who said, we have ignored the person and work of the Holy Spirit. As a result, we have failed to benefit from the power which God has intended Christians to enjoy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the endowment of power which results is being re-examined and rediscovered in some of the evangelical denominations today. For Walker, what he saw in Brazil seemed to confirm a phenomenon he already knew of in cases of individual mainline clergy in the United States having similar experiences. However, it is significant that the Brazilian case was reported in Christian Life before the magazine offered any substantial mention of Dennis Bennett and the happenings amongst Episcopalians in California. Walker, furthermore, informed his readers that the Brazilian mainliners saw the current move of the Holy Spirit as, quote, something akin to but totally different from the Pentecostal doctrine. In other words, here was a discussion of the potential of a distinctive mainline renewal identity before the notion of charismatic renewal had even been popularised in the United States. So the second case, Catholic charismatic renewal and, Mexico, and Mexican Casillo. Casillo was a lay discipleship course founded on the Spanish island of Mallorca in 1944. While it was, of course, not evangelical, it nevertheless fostered in the United States and later in Australia patterns of piety and community life amongst the early Catholic charismatic prayer groups, which were themselves, as some participants uh, were to observe, um, remarkably evangelical in their essence. Casillo entered the United States via Mexico, initially as Spanish language groups from 1957, but by the early 1960s as English language groups. Casillo was characterised by lay empowered community involving scripture readings, spontaneous prayer, singing and discussion. Two dioceses in which it established strong roots were Fort Wayne South Bend and the Diocese of Lansing. It was in these places, the home of the University of Notre Dame, Michigan State and the University of Michigan, that Catholic Pentecostalism spread earliest and most rapidly, moving through an established network already eager for church renewal. For Steve Clark, the member of the National Casillo Secretariat, 
who became the architect of what became the Word of God charismatic community in Ann Arbor, and, therefore, and also the internationally used Life in the Spirit course, it was no accident that Catholic Pentecostalism took off through in these Casillo networks. Those within them have al had already committed to renewal of the church and were likely, quote, to find all the good that was in the new thing. In fact, at one meeting in Notre Dame in 1965, that's two years before um, Catholic Charismatic Renewal kind of officially took off, 1967, there had been a reported case of speaking in tongues. Mexican Casillo piety appears to have had an impact on Clark and others. He recalled first hearing of Casillo through an American priest who had witnessed the movement in Mexico City and who described it in Pentecostal terms as, f as, um, as men, quote, filled with the Holy Spirit, who became effective apostles. Later, Clark met with Mexican Casillo groups and leaders and came to think of Casillo as, something, as, quote, something that would probably be good for Americans too. Casillo helped shape the community dynamics of the Catholic ecumenical prayer groups. And for Clark, one way in which it did so was in relation to practices of embodied affections. Affection. His time spent living in Mexico and his involvement in Casillo, Clark asserted, had showed him how to be more freely affectionate. affectionate. In 1975, he looked back and argued, quote, We need to avoid attitudes like, I'm an American and American men don't hug one another. That's just for those Latins. We discovered that affection among men was liberating for us. In fact, if we had not learned to express love to one another in a much freer way than most Americans do, Christian community would have been a lot harder. For Clark, cross-cultural encounter with Mexican Casillo groups shaped Catholic charismatic renewal from its very earliest days. The third case, renovacion, citywide church and submission in Buenos Aires. In the mid-1970s, some charismatic leaders, particularly those associated with the Fort Lauderdale Ministry of Christian Growth Ministries, began to support the idea of the citywide church, whereby pastors um, in different churches were submitted to each other, seeing themselves as co-elders of the ecumenical body of Christ in that specific geographical area. The idea of the restoration of the New Testament model of one church, one city, or city government as it was sometimes called, was supported in the CGM magazine New Wine and in the ministry of Derek Prince and others. The concept was an example of the continuity between the latter rain movement of 1948 and the charismatic renewal, though an immediate influence was the publication of the writings of the Chinese leader of the Little Flock movement, Watchman Ni, uh, and his uh, writings were read uh, widely within the charismatic renewal, uh, within charismatic renewal circles uh, in the late 1960s and 1970s. The exemplar of the city-wide church in action, though, was Buenos Aires and the ministry of Juan Carlos Ortez and others. What became known as the Renovacion in Buenos Aires began around 1967 among the open brethren in the city, which soon drew in Mennonites, Baptists and Catholics. One of those impacted was the Assemblies of God pastor Ortiz, whose church grew significantly in the context of this wider renewal. Ortiz, along with other pastors in the city, became an advocate of one city, one church, or, as he would explain in it in his preaching, including at Lausanne in 1974, many potatoes, but one mashed potato. He later recalled, quote, Little did I know how much I had to learn until I came together with other pastors, Baptists, Presbyterians, Plymouth Brethren and Catholics. As a proud Pentecostal, I had to become a humble elder in the church. Ortiz and others in the city travelled widely throughout Latin America, where their ministry was particularly significant because of its breaking down barriers between Catholic and Protestant. Buenos Aires became a hub for the renewal. In 1972, the first Latin American Renewal Congress was held in the city at a Catholic retreat centre. <laughs>
the Buenos Aires experiment had a remarkable impact on charismatic ecclesiology in the English-speaking world. Lord Tith, Orville Swindle and others uh, based in Buenos Aires appeared in New Wine magazine and then in 1974 Logos International Fellowship, uh, the main charismatic publisher in the United States, published um, Call to Discipleship by Ortef. The introduction uh, by one of the leading movers and shakers in the US charismatic movement, Jamie Buckingham, claimed, quote, The Church of Buenos Aires has, become, has come very close to being a prototype of the New Testament church in the 20th century. Lord Tith was one of the few Global South charismatics to become established on the international conference circuit of the charismatic renewal in the mid-1970s. The influence of his ecclesiology, however, related only related not only to the one city, one church model. Call to discipleship described discipleship as a spiritual law. There will be no formation in life without submission, Lord Tith said. Significantly in 1973, Lord Tith had been invited to speak at Fort Lauderdale by Don Basham, Bob Mumford and Derek Prince, the men who became the key proponents of the so-called discipleship or shepherding movement. Bob Mumford recognised the extent to which Ortith, uh, the influence of Ortith on his own teaching. Sorry, Bob Mumford recognised the extent of the of the influence of of Ortith on his own teaching on submission. The back cover of, or, of the 1970 book called to Discipleship asserted, "Some see him as a man like Watchman Nee," and indeed Nee's writings had been profoundly influential. Uh, on the ecclesiology of Ortith. From 1974 in the United States, but also in Australia and New Zealand and to a lesser extent the United Kingdom, the shepherding movement nearly broke what unity there was within the charismatic renewal. In the case of Ortith, it was perhaps not so much the substance of his teaching, which charisma some charismatics opposed, but the clearly abusive ways in which some had put into practice those teachings locally. As Michael Harper, the English charismatic leader, said before uh, Ortith arrived uh, on a, a visit to the UK sponsored by the Evangelical Alliance in 1976, I was impressed with the book, called to Discipleship, as I have been disturbed by some of its attempted expressions in this country. If the word nurturing had been used, it might have helped. In demonstrating the results of Nee's approach to submission in discipleship, Lord Tith and others from the city contributed to the most significant controversy to face the charismatic renewal in the English-speaking world in the 1970s. Finally, Latin America and the Anglican and Latin America and Anglican Church growth. The Anglican Church in Latin America was a tiny denomination in Latin American terms. However, from the early 1970s, news of the Anglican renewal in Chile was reaching the networks of Anglican and Episcopalian renewalists in the United States and England. In April 1972, the Reverend Dennis Bennett uh, in Seattle received a letter from the Assemblies of God missionary Arthur Lindvall, describing how the previous month he had been surprised to receive an invitation to visit the Valparaiso office of the Conservative Evangelical um, Assistant Bishop uh, of the area, David Pitches, an Englishman. On entering the room, he was told, start talking about the Holy Spirit, we want to know him. The previous month, the bishop's wife, Mary Pitches, had experienced spirit, spirit baptism while travelling back from furlough uh, by boat, uh, in, uh, furlough in England. Linval was invited to join um, Kathleen Clark, a spirit-baptised South American Missionary Society worker in the south of Chile, in bringing teaching to the bishop and his clergy. The Anglican work in Chile, Lindval argued, was on the brink of renewal. Indeed, during Pitchy's time in Chile, various Anglican congregations underwent significant growth, which Pitchy's, who became in 1972 Bishop of Chile, Bolivia and Peru, described as, quote, spontaneous growth. Pitchy's brought news of Anglican growth in his Latin American diocese to both England and the United States. In 1975, he was invited to speak to uh, Episcopalians in Pittsburgh, 
who would soon take an important role in the coordination of the resurgence of evangelical and charismatic uh, congregations in that denomination. Then, after returning to England in 1977, he took over the charismatic congregation of St Andrew's Chorley Wood. Here, he sought approaches which might produce the same kind of growth that he had seen in Chile. Another former South American Missionary Society worker, Eddie Gibbs, recommended the ministry of John Wimber, the Californian church planter whose every member lay power ministry approach was in some ways a Californian attempt to indigenize the Latin American church growth and power ministry, which C. Peter Wagner had described in his 1973 book, Look Out, the Pentecostals Are Coming. Pitches invited Wimber to England in 1981. Um, Pitches had returned from Chile at a time when Engl English renewalists were looking for a new thing which might provide something like a second wind for the movement. Pitches witness to spontaneous growth in Chile and his advocacy of Wimber's approach of power ministry offered exactly this. By a circuitous route, Pitches too had an important role in mediating Wimber's approach to American Episcopalians. In 1987 and 1988, Episcopal Renewal Ministries invited Pitches to teach on power evan evangelism and power ministry. Pitches' experiences in Chile and those of various other global North evangelicals in Latin America had an important influence on the direction of charismatic renewal as it appeared to enter a new phase of development in the 1980s. A few conclusions. Through these four brief case studies, we have demonstrated that while the English-speaking world was dominant in the production of the media-driven subculture, which was charismatic renewal, Latin America had a substantial role in its shaping. As David Swartz has argued in the case of the United States, to understand the recent development of American evangelicalism, to understand recent developments in American evangelicalism, it is necessary to consider the global reflex. Certainly, charismatic renewal had its own global reflexes. As we've seen, uh, the influence of Latin, and was, as we've seen in the case of the influence of Latin Americans and missionaries working in the region. We've seen in these examples from Brazil, Mexico, Chile and Argentina, that Latin America made a significant contribution to the evangelical imaginary of re-enchantment from the 1950s, to Catholic ecumenical approaches to community from the mid-1960s, to the restoration ecclesiology of some charismatics from the early 1970s, and from the charismatic church growth impulses in the Anglican Church in the late 1970s and 1980s. Across these four decades in the emergence and development of charismatic renewal in the English-speaking world, Latin America often played an important role.